Greetings all, and welcome to A Knight's Thoughts, a series in which I, Jackson Knight, give my own rambly, unscripted opinions on certain topics and subjects. Today, my subject of discussion is Transformers The Rise of the Beast, the recent Transformers movie that just came out. I went to see it yesterday, and I thought I'd give my thoughts here for you all. Now, a little bit of background for me. I have been a Transformers fan basically my entire life. It's one of the first fandoms I ever got into. I've been collecting Transformers since I was very, very little. Um, the first one I ever owned was actually Hot Shot from Transformers Armada, so you can imagine my excitement when Legacy came out with an updated version of that figure. I definitely had to get that. But yes, I've enjoyed Transformers most of my life, but I've had kind of a complicated relationship with them on the big screen. Mostly because I feel I feel the movies really failed to capture what I love about Transformers for a very, very long time. Now as I've grown up and I've gone back and watched the Michael Bay films, I do admit they actually do have some quality to them. The first movie actually has a really stellar underlying plot for a Transformer story, in my opinion. I mean, the entire thing from from the the Allspark landing on Earth, Megatron being frozen in ice, and everything having to lead up to both of those things, the arrival of the Autobots, the Decepticons attacking, the Army Rangers and Katar, there's a really good story there. I just feel like the story was kind of lost in the teenage drama of Shia LaBeouf's character, Sam Witwicky, and the needless TNA and gross humor. But that wouldn't become as much of a problem until later movies. Revenge of the Fallen, I have no love lost for, <laughs> with the exception of perhaps the forest battle near the beginning. I thought that was a fantastic scene. I thought seeing Optimus go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Megatron, Starscream, and another Decepticon, Grindor, but you might as well call them Blackout. I thought it was really cool. And, well, action is at the center of Transformers, if we're being blunt, so whenever people are like, I don't like action in my Transformers movies, it's like, what franchise do you think this is? This, like, while we can explore deep topics, this isn't exactly a a peaceable story. It's a story based on war, after all. <clears throat> but yeah, I have no love lost for Into the Fallen. Dark of the Moon, I actually feel very similarly to the first movie. It's It's got a lot of merits to it, and I actually think the central plot is really good. I think Central Prime is actually a fantastic villain. I think the entire human collaborators plot is really great. Laserbeak is absolutely terrifying. Optimus, for the most part, I actually quite like. I actually don't mind him executing Sentinel, mostly because, well, he was going to do the same thing to Megatron in the 1986 movie. It made sense. I do have a problem with how he dispatched Megatron in Dark of the Moon, though. Age of Extinction felt like it didn't know what it was. It felt like several different movies crammed into one. I mean, how many villains did we need? Because we had Attinger and Cemetery Wind as one villain. Then we had Lockdown as another. Then we had KSI as another. And then we had Galvatron as the last one. And it really didn't feel like any of those villains had a chance to breathe because each of them had individual moments that I think are really, really good. Lockdown has a presence that I actually really like. Though he's not my personal favorite version of Lockdown that has to go to animated, which is the definitive Lockdown in my opinion. And I think Galvatron should have been Nemesis Prime, personally. But that would come in the next movie. But Age of Extinction, I saw what they were going for. But, well... And the selling point of that movie, the Dinobots, they barely showed up at all. Which, how do you waste the Dinobots? The Dinobots are an amazing spectacle. I mean... Going back to Generation 1, the Dinobots are great. Kind of lost my train of thought there, but I'm just going to 
keep rambling on, but then we come to The Last Night, which is a movie that I don't think has any merits. Well, it has one, Megatron's design. Easily the best Megatron's ever looked in live action. Unfortunately, it is in an absolutely garbage film. Of course, we, there would be a little bit of a glimmer of light later with Bumblebee. I actually really like Bumblebee. Of course, I have to take Bumblebee as what it is. It very much is a slice of life story with a Cybertronian aspect. Some people like to say that people only like Bumblebee for that first scene on Cybertron. While well, the first thing I've seen on Cybertron is probably my favorite thing I've ever seen in a Transformers live action film. I hesitate to call it live action that scene because it's kind of like The Lion King, it's all CG, but. It looks great, nonetheless. I'd take a film animated like that on Cybertron, though I know the budget for that would be quite expensive. But regardless, that scene is probably my favorite thing I've ever seen in a Transformers movie because it is pure Generation 1 nostalgia and I love it. But I really like the rest of the movie too. But I have to take it as what it is. It's not a grand scale Transformers adventure like the previous ones are. It's a slice of life, a lot of people compare it to kind of a combination between E.T. and the Iron Giant, and I can really see that. But I don't think that's a bad thing. At the end of the day, I enjoy Bumblebee for what it is, but it was never going to be a franchise darling. There's a reason that even now its following is very cult. Like, yeah, you have Transformers fans who really love it, but in terms of a wider audience, there aren't a lot of people who are particularly fond of Bumblebee. But that does bring us to the recent movie, Rise of the Beast, which I have been hyped for ever since that first trailer. Well, technically I've been hyped for ever since they said they're making a sequel to Bumblebee, because I liked Bumblebee, and I thought it was a good direction. <laughs> of course, the film has had a troubled production history, so I had to wait a long time. There was a point there that I was worried we weren't going to get it, and Transformers in Cinema was just kind of going to be left high and dry. But then we got that first trailer, and I was hooked immediately. I mean, it opens up strong. We have Optimus Primal coming in, and he just looked so good. We have Optimus jumping in in a slightly modified version of his Bumblebee look. He also looked so good. The entire driving scene with Mirage using holograms and shifting like transforming in his vehicle mode, like interchanging around, that was really cool. And Mirage in general, I'll get to Mirage in the movie itself, but plus what little we saw of the villains, it just, it pulled me in. But I was aware that it's entirely possible that they may be duping us. Cause you know, that happens. You get a good trailer into the movie absolutely sucks. But I was optimistic. Not optimistic, if you will. But I was, and I waited and I watched every trailer. I typically don't do that, but well, I'll be real with you, I haven't exactly been excited for many Transformers projects coming out lately. Like, toys, yes, there have been some great figures that have come out lately, but in terms of projects, Earthspark didn't exactly catch my fancy. Um, like, Reactivate looks cool, but I just don't think we have enough for me to get pumped about it. Like, I really haven't felt excited for a Transformers project since, like, Transformers Prime. Which is, well, no, I did feel excited for R.I.D. I just was disappointed. Because <laughs> that was really bad. I wanted to be excited for the Netflix shows, but well, I'm kind of glad I wasn't because uh, that was disappointing. But now to the point of was I disappointed by Rise of the Beasts, I wasn't. And I'll get into that. See, going into Rise of the Beasts, I had a few criteria. I wanted to have fun. That's something that I insist on films nowadays. Because I've had so many films lately that have been preachy, or boring, or confusing. And I was just to the point, it's like, I just want a fun movie. 
And I've had some good fun movies this year. Desert Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons, sorry, Honor Among Thieves was a fun movie. And as a D&D nerd, I loved that movie. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is intense but fun. Probably my favorite of the Guardians movies. Um, the little bit I've seen of Mario and, into, and Across the Spider-Verse look really, really good. I just haven't seen those movies yet. But that was part of my criteria going into Rise of the Beasts, I want to have fun. Number two, I want to feel like I'm watching a Transformers movie, not a disaster film with Transformers in it, which was part of Michael Bay's, or a teen drama with Transformers in it. I didn't want either of those. Again, both of those very much felt like what Michael Bay was doing, because on the one hand, you have this disaster movie, Decepticons are coming in, destroying everything, and on the other hand, you have the teenage drama of Sam Witkin. Sam Witwicky. I apologize. <laughs> but I wanted to feel like I was watching a Transformers movie, as in, it's about the robots. Number three, I wanted the robot cast to actually have personality. Not just be multiple different colored blobs, but actually have personality. So, those were my only criteria. Well, and I would enjoy it, but I think that falls under fun movie. I wasn't expecting it to be high cinema or anything. Anyone who goes into a Transformers movie expecting high cinema is kind of delusional, in my opinion. I mean, I love Transformers. It actually has a lot of depth to it as a franchise when you get into it, but let's be real. At its core, it's... It's robots who turn into trucks and fight each other. That's really what it is at its core. So I wasn't expecting anything high cinema. I wasn't expecting the Citizen Kane of Transformers movies. I was just expecting a fun movie. And that's what I got. So my thoughts, my general thoughts on the film is I really, really liked it. I thought it was really good. I think it is personally the best live-action Transformers film from a Transformers fan's perspective, and not just, I got into the Michael Bay movies when I was a kid. If those were your G1, that is perfectly fine, and they weren't mine. My G1 was technically Armada, but I did grow up with G1 as well, because my, my, dad, my dad loved G1, and so he showed it to us as a kid, but technically my G1 was Armada. <laughs> so... I had a lot of G1, Beast Wars, Armada, Animated Prime. Those are where I really take my Transformers feelings from, not the Bane movies. Again, even though I think the Bane movies do actually, in hindsight, have a lot of merit. And this movie felt like a good answer to that. I mean, in the beginning, we start on Jungle Planet. Now, the idea of a jungle planet has been thrown around for a while. Uh, it was in Transformers Cybertron. Um, it was in the, I think it was the IDW comics. They mentioned that the Beast Formers are from a different planet. It might have been the Dreamwave comic, I don't know. I didn't exactly keep up with the comics, which is a shame, because as I've gotten older, I've found I really like some of them. IDW, I have opinions on, but that's for something else. I've rambled as it, enough as it is. <clears throat> But I thought that was a really cool idea, a really cool way to show why the Maximals are beasts instead of vehicles, and why they're techno-organic beasts instead of mechanical beasts like the Insecticons or the Dinobots. <clears throat> but that beginning was really intense. Seeing Unicron in live action was, was something to behold. Though I should also mention <laughs> Should have mentioned this at the get-go, but this will contain spoilers for Transformers Rise of the Beast. So if you want to watch it, you probably should have clicked off a little while ago. That's my bad. <laughs> but seeing Unicron live action, hearing Unicron's theme remixed, it was something indescribable. Because, see, one of my earliest memories of Transformers is watching the 1986 Transformers movie. My parents uh, showed that to me when I was very, very young. 
and Unicron has a presence. He's one of those antagonists that just sticks with me even to this day. His voice, his absolute presence, his design, everything. The fact that he's basically a Transformer Elder God is just really, really cool to me. And hearing Optimus Primal describe him as an evil dark god that consumes all life was just shivers down the spine. So seeing him was so cool. And then seeing the Maximals was also really, really cool. Now, I've never been as big of a Beast Wars guy as some people are, but I do love Beast Wars. I mean, Dinobot is one of my favorite Transformers characters. He's definitely my favorite character from Beast Wars, so just... I think he's an immensely fascinating character. I was kind of bummed he didn't appear in any capacity, but... I'll get to one of my criticisms later to where it's probably a good thing he didn't show up. <clears throat> but seeing the Maximals, and even an obscure character like a Plank, that was really, really cool. But the moment that I really went, ooh, was when we saw the actual big bad of the film. Like, Unicron is the overlying threat through the whole thing, but the actual villain is Scourge. And I'm going to say it, best live-action Transformers villain. Just bar none so far. Because Megatron in the first one, while he was great, he didn't have a lot of screen time. What screen time he got was awesome, but we just didn't get a lot of it. The Fallen was a nothing burger, which was a shame and an absolute waste of that character. Sentinel was really good, but he was kind of bogged down by the fact that we didn't get enough time with him and Optimus before the trail. Like, I kept thinking while I was watching Dark of the Moon, there needs to be at least one more scene here. We need more time with Optimus and Sentinel. Because I like what we have, we just don't have enough of it. Again, I liked Lockdown, but he suffered from being shoved in to a crowded movie, and Quintessa is just the absolute worst. <laughs> like, she makes the Fallen look like a good villain, and you done messed up if you made the Fallen from Revenge of the Fallen look like a good villain. Absolute waste of Tony Todd, I swear. But, <clears throat> Scourge? Not disappointing in the slightest. Seeing him emerging from the shadows on Jungle Planet, just the orange lights from his eyes and from his chest as he walks into frame. It's so ominous. I love ominous villains. Peter Dinklage's voice was so good. And it just gave this character such gravitas. And the way he moved, it was... Like, he stole the show every scene he was in. And the way he just absolutely one-shots a blink. It was just so cool. And getting to see Optimus Primal kind of reflecting on everything. Like, Optimus Primal is a standout character for me from this. But I'll get more into him later. Well, as is customary for a live-action Transformers, or for Transformers in general, I'm going to be blunt here, after a bit of an introduction, we flash to the humans. Now, I want to go in on a little bit of a rant here. I mean, this entire thing is kind of a rant. But people who complain about humans and Transformers confuse me. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think that human presence does need to be lessened in a lot of projects, but... Humans have been a part of Transformers since the beginning. A pretty central part at that. The problem isn't that humans exist, the problem is the humans steal focus from the bots, and they're not interesting. That's the issue. I mean, there were human characters who were actually some of my favorite human characters ever. I mean, I'm a huge fan of most of the humans in Transformers Prime. 
Jack is great. Raph, while a bit of a Mary Sue at times, I do really like. Not a fan of Miko. <laughs> when I was a kid, I liked Miko more, but as I've gotten older, I, I cannot stand Miko. But we do have Agent Fowler, and Agent Fowler is the best human character to ever exist. June is also a really great human character, in my opinion. Sorry, in animated, she's... She's a mixed bag for me. I think as the show goes on, she actually... I warm up to her a lot, but in the early episodes, she really annoyed me. But not because she was human, but because she was that archetype of... I'm a little nit who's gonna make trouble. It's kind of similar to why I'm not a huge fan of animated Bumblebee. <laughs> Even though I like most other characters. Animated Prowl. I love Animated Prowl. He's such a good character. Optimus has a great arc. Oops. In Animated, Ratchet, Bulkhead, the Decepticons are some of my favorite renditions of them. But not a huge fan of Bumblebee. And Sorry kind of has that to an extent. But as time goes on, I do grow up. Grow. I do warm up to Sorry. Spike is kind of a nothing burger in G1. He's he's harmless, but he's just kind of there. Sparkplug, on the other hand, like he's always helping Ratchet and Wheeljack with their inventions, and I think that's really cool. Carly! We're supposed to believe that she's a super smart MIT grad, but she's kind of just the pretty face. I like Chip. I actually really like Chip. I think he's a great character. I feel like in a more well thought out show, Chip could be a very compelling protagonist. He's kind of like Raph but better, in my opinion. <clears throat> the kids in Armada, uh, I have opinions. Um, Alexis, I think, is great. Carlos, despite being a Spanglish stereotype, I think is pretty funny. Billy and Fred suck, and Rad's... He's kind of like Spike. He's just kind of a nothing. He's just kind of there. Um, Kicker Jones is, tr is trash. Throw him in the freaking trash, along with the rest of the show. <clears throat> um, the kids in Cybertron are okay. I don't have any real major negative or positive feelings about them, except maybe Bud from time to time. Again, he's kind of like, sorry, in the beginning. He's kind of annoying. And then, of course, there's Sam. Sam is just an awful character, and Cade's even worse. But the character of this film, of Rise of the Beast, Noah, I really like Noah. I think he's a great character. One, he's not a teenager. He's a young man, but he's not a teenager. So we're not dealing with teenage drama, or even college drama. We're dealing with I'm trying to provide for my family drama, and oof, that hits you. As a guy who's getting into his mid-twenties, that's, that hits me. It's kind of what I wanted Spider-Man to be for the last little while, but I'm not going to get into Spider-Man. That'll just make me ramble even more. <laughs> But, no, I really like Noah. I thought he was very compelling. I thought his parallel arc with Optimus was great. Um, the fact that he's ex-military, and that's why he's a bit more chill under pressure, really made sense. And it kind of reminded me of a criticism I had of the Bay movies, of where I thought that Captain Lennox would have made a better main character. Because he's a soldier, he dealt with the Decepticons at Ground Zero, he could empathize with bots like Optimus a bit more easily. And to this day, I think Lennox is a great character. Like, up there with Agent Fowler. But, yeah, Noah's ex-military, and that's made very clear. His problems are very relatable. Um, his whole I was dishonorably discharged thing kind of reminds me of another personal favorite character of mine from the Stargate franchise, John Shepard, the main character of Stargate Atlantis. He wasn't discharged, he was just kept from promoting. <laughs> but the whole I have a duty to my family type thing, that was really compelling. And it was, it was just really good. 
I really liked Noah. I liked Noah's family. Chris is freaking adorable. The little we saw of his mom, I loved. The whole white people loved that. That was funny to me. I cracked up in the theater. But then we do come to one of the lower points of the movie, in my opinion, and that's Elena. I don't think she's bad. I don't think she's a bad character. I just... I just don't think there's enough for her to do. Like, I really do feel like you could give most of her role to Noah, and it wouldn't change the movie much. Or Chris. Just, she kind of exists to be the token geek, which um, doesn't really work. I mean, you think back to Raph in Transformers Prime, for example. Yeah, he's kind of the token geek, but he also... He also has a character... Okay, no, Elena does have a character. I'm just not a fan of it. But... Raph kind of has a role to play. Again, it can get a little deus ex machina. It's like, oh, I can hack the Pentagon. <laughs> what? Dude, you're 12. How is that even possible? But... I don't know. I don't know what it is. Like Between the two main human characters, Elena is definitely the weak link for me. And again, a lot of her arc could have been given to Noah and the movie wouldn't have been affected much. She does have some good scenes later, though. So I don't hate her. I just kind of feel she wasn't needed, if that makes sense. Or at least not needed as a main character. She could have very easily been the person to kickstart everything, but she's not a, but she dies in the process. That's not exactly uncommon in stories like this. Not that I'm thinking she should die, and Dominic Fishback did do a good job. Like, I don't have any problem with the performance, it's just the character felt superfluous. And she's not the only character who feels superfluous. There's a few of them. Um, but beyond that, Noah's struggles really hit you. And the thing I actually liked is you have these three characters, these three very minor characters. You have the administrator at the hospital, you have the security firm guy, and you have the museum curator. They're all kind of minor human antagonists, but they don't feel cartoonishly evil. Like, the security firm guy, I get it. I get why he wouldn't want to hire Noah. Because, well, you really get the sense that the security dude is ex-military himself. Not to mention a security job requires a lot of discipline. And, well, we see it from Noah's perspective, but the security guy doesn't. So I get why he didn't want to hire Noah. The minister at the hospital... I know people have a lot of opinions when it comes to, like, hospitals and money and stuff like that, but to be blunt, she's doing her job. And this isn't like a soldier, I was following orders type thing. This is straight up, this is my job. I could get fired. Not only that, I could, like, there is a reason why hospitals can't typically provide free health care. I'm not going to go into that it's frustrating it's one of those frustrating things of life but she also doesn't feel evil she just but she is kind of an antagonistic force and that does bring us to the curator she's a little cartoonishly hateable only a little but not too much because people like that do exist and especially in the 90s, and it's very clear that to me that Elena comes from a poor background. Her, her father didn't have a college education. I wonder if she did, or if the stuff she knows is just because of what she learned from her dad. Um, not to mention she was a minority living in Brooklyn in the 90s. There was a bit of a stigma back then. <laughs> So it kind of makes sense that you'd have this curator woman who's obviously well off, 
who acts like she knows everything while you have Elena who does actually know everything but isn't allowed to progress forward. It kind of makes sense. Like, even if you take race out of the equation, she's obviously from a low-income family, she's probably not college-educated, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but the thing about these characters is they're so minor, so even any quibbles I might have about them, they exist to serve the plot, and that's not a bad thing, contrary to what certain people like to say for some reason. But... <sighs> Yeah, so that's my thoughts on those. Then we have a human character who's not sure what to classify him as besides a hoot, and that's Rink, who is uh, Noah's friend. Dude is hilarious, okay? He's also kind of a catalyst for a lot of stuff that goes on. So what happens next is um, they discover a Falcon statue um, in Sudan. And the curator's like, oh, it's Horus. It's the god Horus. But Elena's like, it doesn't look like Horus. And well, to those of us looking, it's got a maximal symbol. It's like, oh, that's Air Razor, obvious. And on the other side of the coin, you have Noah who bombs his job interview and Reek is trying to get him to steal a car to earn money. Noah, being down on his luck, agrees. <clears throat> well, the car he steals happens to be more than meets the eye. Um, while doing unauthorized lab testing, Elena discovers that there is something inside this hawk statue. That something happens to be half of the transwarp key, which is the MacGuffin of the movie. And this is when we get to see my boy, Optimus Prime, come on screen. And my goodness, guys, he looks so good. Yes, he looks better in Bumblebee, but I'm not going to discount how good he looks here either. My only complaint is I wish he'd kept the, the mask up more, but... That's an opinion I've had of a lot of Optimuses, even some of my favorite franchises. I don't like Optimus with a mouth. Like, Optimus with the mask on is best Optimus. I mean, that's the classic Optimus. That's the look that everyone is going to remember. Why are we still insisting on giving him a freaking mouth? I don't get it. I, I never have, and I don't think I ever will. It's kind of ridiculous. But, regardless, um, Optimus notices a signal that is visible only to Autobots and other Cybertronians, not to humans, which is a cool, cool way of keeping the in-disguise thing. I actually really liked that. It's a very comic booky, Transformers-y explanation, and those are, the, those are the kinds of things that I personally, as a dude who grew up on comics and Transformers and sci-fi, love. I don't find, like, I don't feel like I need to suspend my disbelief when it comes to that. I mean, if I believe a spider can bite a dude and he has superpowers, I can believe this, okay? But we get the calling all Autobots scene, and it, it, it reminded me of Transformers Prime a little, because at the beginning of Transformers Prime, we have Optimus, like, RC, Bulkhead, Bumblebee, Rendezvous back at base and be prepared to ground bridge. It kind of reminded me of that. And we are introduced to the bulk of the robot cast. Uh, with Bumblebee, who is rocking his look from the end of his solo movie. He looks great. RC, who also looks great. And I have a lot of positive thoughts about RC in this movie. As well as Prime and uh, a certain silver Porsche. Now, no, the Porsche isn't our boy Jazz. It is instead... Yep. Sorry, I have technical issues with my mic. There we go. It is instead our boy Mirage. Now, in the first trailer, there was a, a lot of fracas around this, but I'm going to be blunt with y'all. The only other character in this movie who has his G1 ult mode is Optimus. And even he doesn't, because he doesn't have the trailer. 
Bumblebee's a Camaro. B wasn't a Camaro in G1. RC's a motorcycle. She wasn't a cycle in G1. But no, RC's not a motorcycle in Generation 1. So it doesn't bother me. Especially since F1s aren't exactly street legal. So it makes sense. Where do I go from there? Oh yeah. Well, Noah steals the Porsche, or rather the Porsche steals him because Optimus goes all calling all Autobots. And so all Autobots begin to gather. And then we lead to a scene that we actually saw a lot of in the trailer. Kind of wish they hadn't spoiled as much of it in the trailer. But, you know, that's, that's how it goes. That's how these things go. But I thought it was a great scene nonetheless. And I didn't mind seeing it. And there were certain details that weren't in the trailer that I thought were really fun. Um, like, the Mirage copies have Noah copies. And there's one that flips off the cops behind him. Thought it was really funny. But, so... Mirage ends up taking Noah back to the Autobots base, which is this warehouse. And Noah is understandably freaked out. He's like, what the frick are you? And then the other Autobots arrive. And this kind of kickstarts something that I've noticed be a little controversial. And that's Optimus's character arc. Now, my thoughts? I like it. I like it a lot. In the words of Mirage, I like it a lot. I think that's a reference to another movie. I don't know. Probably not one I've ever watched. <clears throat> but... The thing about Prime, typically, as a character, is... is typically already pre-developed by the time stories begin. Typically, he goes through stuff when he's Orion Pax... And then by the time he's Optimus, or in the early days of being Optimus, and by the time they're on Earth, he's a pretty fully developed character. So development ends up going to characters like Bumblebee, or Ratchet, or Ironhide, or whoever. Hot Shot, Hot Rod, Smokescreen. So Prime kind of ends up being kind of like a mentor character. And that's not a bad thing. But... I like that they gave him a character arc this time, because, well, in Transformers Animated, he had a character arc, but that's because his character was basically Orion Pax. He was a much younger Optimus. In Transformers Prime, he does a character arc as well, it's just, it's a bit more understated and a lot of people miss it. I'll, I might do a, a video on that later, but in this, Prime's arc is... He blames himself for being for everyone being stranded on Earth, and he's kind of bitter, and he's kind of has this "I'm going to protect my own" sort of mentality, and that does cause some people to go, "Wait, what?" But Optimus is always about freedom is the right of all sentient beings, and I, I get it, I really do. And by the end of the movie, he is, but the way it starts off. This is a prime who's traumatized. This is a prime who's been hurt. And it really does feel like he expected to be back on Cybertron by now. So, it's an interesting take, and one I actually am a fan of. Would I say it's my ideal Optimus Prime character arc? No. My ideal Prime character arc would be kind of the opposite, in fact. Uh, it would probably be a more overstated one of his arc in Transformers Prime. Like, he starts off wanting to be diplomatic. He starts off wanting to go, look, we don't have to fight anymore. Look, we're all the same. And then he ends up having, like, he ends up reaching the point where he's like, that's it, Megatron, I'm done with you. That's my ideal arc for Optimus Prime, and of course there'd be more details in between, but this arc isn't bad in the slightest. I actually think it's really good. Um, again, we meet the bulk of our robot cast here, and I love them. 
Bumblebee is a continuation of his character in Bumblebee, and he's great. He's absolutely adorable, but kick... He, he kicks butt, okay? He's, he's great. RC, I was pleasantly surprised that they gave RC a character. Because she typically doesn't have one. The last time she really did was Transformers Prime. Typically, RC is just kind of girl. Like, in G1, she's the girl robot. It's kind of funny how the more less, how the lesser known fembots in the show had more to them. Because Chromia was tough and no-nonsense, and Firestar was, well, fiery, and Moonracer was all about need for speed and all that. And Elita 1 was very much, very similar to Optimus. She was very much a leader. Like, they really did feel like Ironhide, like Chromia and Elita especially, really felt like Ironhide and Optimus, but feminine. And not just female, but feminine. They were feminine. But RC's character for a long time was just feminine. And, well, in Transformers Animated, she was more of a plot device than a character. Not an all necessity an issue. Like it's not a detriment against the show, but it does kind of just boil her character down. She she existed in Energon, I guess. In the movies, again, she existed, but here she's actually got a character, and it's actually pretty similar to her Transformers Prime character because she's all kind of aloof and silent. She's kind of the serious one of the team, and I really like it. And then we come to Mirage. Now, this guy is not like your standard Mirage. <laughs> but I don't mind it. Your standard Mirage is... He's very soft-spoken. He's a pacifist. At the end of the day, he just wants to get back to Cybertron. He just wants to get back home, which there is a hint in his backstory that he is... Um, actually wealthy. He is of the upper class of Cybertron, which is kind of interesting because you don't normally think of upper class in Cybertron. But it also kind of makes sense with his more soft-spoken, his kind of almost upper class sounding voice, like, sorry Prime, the ship was full, is his more genteel aspect, the reason why he's a pacifist. Like, Mirage really does feel like the kind of guy who wants the good old days. This Mirage, on the other hand... Oh, I've seen a lot of people trying to compare him to Jazz, but no! This is a very different character from Jazz. See, Jazz is always smooth. Jazz is cool. He's not wild, he's cool. Like, and even though he's chill, he's always in the zone, if, if that makes sense. As in the fighting zone. Like, yeah, Jazz is chill, but you notice Optimus doesn't get mad at him. <laughs> In fact, Optimus typically likes Jazz, because Jazz is the kind of guy who's able to balance I'm having fun with we need to fight. Like, and that's one of the things I actually really love about G1 is the implications, because Jazz is Optimus' second-in-command. But he's the super chill guy. Like, you'd think Ironhide would be a second in command, because he's the gruff soldier, but no, it's Jazz. And more than that, Jazz is a good second in command. Mirage isn't. <laughs> Mirage, like, I wouldn't even call him a punk kid. He's just a weirdo. <laughs> like, that's how I describe Rise of the Beast Mirage. He's just weird. And I like it. <laughs> kind of reminds me of how I feel about Adam Warlock in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. He is not accurate to his comic book character, but my word, he is a riot. And Mirage is an absolute riot. Plus, the entire movie, Mirage, like, one, he utilizes Mirage's, which is the ability he has. He unfortunately doesn't go invisible, which is kind of a shame because that's Mirage's main ability. Before anyone goes, oh, no, it's Hound who has the holograms. Mirage also has holographic ability. In fact, holographic ability is why he's able to turn invisible. 
Like, he doesn't show it in the cartoons, but it is in his bio, I think. I'd have to double check. But Mirage has had holographic abilities before. Yeah, in the cartoon, Hound is more well-known for holograms. But the guy named Mirage has to have holograms. <laughs> but again, I am kind of bummed he didn't turn invisible. Because he's also like a Mirage. He vanishes. But he also shows to have kind of a... I'm not sure what it is, but almost like a weaponizer gimmick? Like, Mirage almost seems to have the ability to shift into other things, because he there's a little thing at the beginning there where he turns into a uh, Formula One racing car, which is his Generation 1 vehicle mode, as well as Sideswipe's Generation 1 vehicle mode as a Lamborghini. And he's able to turn into a garbage truck later, but I think that one was Illusion. So, and in the end, he ends up turning into a suit of armor as well. A suit of battle armor for Noah, which, I'm like, does, is Barat, is, can all Cybertronians do this in this universe, or is this just a Mirage thing? Because I'm fine either way, because I want to see where this goes. This is interesting. Because, well, we're, t we're used to triple changers, and six changers, like six shot, but then he had Mirage, is like, I can be whatever I want. It's like... Wait, how is that possible? I'm kind of intrigued to see how this is explained, or if it's explained. And if it's not, I'm fine with that. Like, the character was fun nonetheless. But yes, Mirage is an absolute riot. He's definitely a different character. He... But I like him. I really like him. Well... The team ends up going to the museum, where the transport key is located. Unfortunately, they don't arrive unscathed, because the terror cons arrive in the form of Scourge, Battletrap, Nightbird, and the Freezers, which is what I'm calling them, because that's what the toy calls them. They're these little bug dudes that crawl around Scourge. And I gotta say, I like him. <laughs> like, I already mentioned earlier, I really like Scourge, but I like Battle Trap and Nightbird a lot, too. You know, yeah, they don't have a lot to do, but I don't think they need to. It, it really kind of feels like Zod, Ursa, and Non, almost. Like, Nightbird was really cool. <laughs> like, the way... She kind of captured that ninja persona she had, like her original form, which was a human-designed ninja robot. And Battle Trap really kind of had a Transformers Prime breakdown kind of vibe to him, but more severe. And I thought they were great. Could there have been more done with them? I guess, but I'm fine with what we got. Like this is this is something that kind of bothers me with a lot of modern day discourses. It's like, oh, we, every villain has to be super fleshed out. It's like, no, sometimes they just need to be an obstacle for the heroes to overcome. And these guys were an obstacle. Like, not everything needs to be super interesting. It just needs to be fun. And these guys were a lot of fun. The fight at the museum... <laughs> fight at the museum. <laughs> the Pharaoh Akhenaten, where are you? Achman Ra, not Akhenaten. Anyway... The fight at the museum was pretty great. It was a lot of fun. I love seeing the bonding between Noah and Elena. Like, Elena really got to shine in this one. I thought, I thought she was fun. <laughs> the horror elements with the little guys chasing them through the museum was great. There's a lot of great horror moments with the little dudes. There's another one later when they're in the ruins. But... The Autobots absolutely get their cans kicked by the Terror Cons. And um, Bumblebee is stabbed by Scourge. He tries to save Optimus' life. He gets stabbed. His Autobot insignia is ripped off his head. And Bee's out for most of the movie. Which is kind of a nice change of pace. Because while Bee... Bumblebees has a tendency to be very, very oversaturated. I like Bumblebee. I really do. He's kind of like the Joker. He's everywhere. Stop. 
there are other Autobots. And I get why Optimus is always there. He's the leader. But... There's so much Bumblebee, like... Give us Cliff Jumper. Give us Drift. Give us Blur. Give us Jetfire. Give us the Dinobots. Give us Bulkhead. I swear. Give us Hot Shot and Hot Rod again. We don't need a million Bumblebees. But it was... There's a lot of stuff with Bumblebee that will come later that I also really liked, but... This... It was very emotional. And it really does help with Optimus' arc going forward. Then Air Razor shows up, and I think Air Razor is also really great. She's definitely very different from her Beast Wars counterpart. This one's a bit quieter, more intellectual. She almost feels older. Like, Beast Wars Air Razor almost felt like a young warrior trying to find her place, whereas this one feels like... She feels very matronly, and I like it. Well, they end up going to Peru, which is where the other half of the transport key is, and this actually brings me to a really, really cool moment, a really cool callback. So Scourge cyber skypes with um, Unicron, and Unicron is like, you fool, when he realizes that Scourge only has half the key. It's very reminiscent of the 86 movie when Unicron did that with Galvatron, and I was like, yes! Plus, it set up Unicron, because we've seen what Scourge can do. So the Unicron is an actual threat, and I really liked that. It really gave us a sense of, oh, this dude bad. I mean, as a Transformers nerd, I already knew that, but it was really cool to see. Plus, it was cool that Unicron has a presence, despite not being present most of the time. Unicron's presence is felt throughout the film. Plus, like, you look at the Terracons, especially Scourge, and you can tell, wait, I th don't think these guys are alive. Because Scourge has, like, a hole in his head. When his mask is ripped off later, it kind of looks like a zombie face. So I think these guys are undead, which kind of lines up with the Terracon name, because in Transformers Prime, Terracon was a term for the zombies raised by Dark Energon. And, um... <clears throat> Air Razor does say that they are controlled by Dark Energy, which gave me some Dark Energon vibes, and I was like, heck yeah. But, <clears throat> so, the bots and, well, they're still cons, they're just terror cons, they're Decepticons, and they're going to Peru, which is where the second half of the key is. And we have this really nice little Peruvian cultural moment. Some people thought this part was boring, I, I thought it was inoffensive, I was like, well, that's cool. Scourge has some absolutely killer lines, things like, Tear the flesh from their bones, or So the Autobots' pets will lead us to it, or something like that. Go fetch, kill the other human. Just the way he speaks, it's this classic evil villain, and I love it. Um, the, the, the Autobots talk in vehicle mode, which is, that's awesome. That really is awesome to me. This does, however, bring me to another superfluous character, and he's probably the character that has had the most controversy around him, and honestly, it's deserved. Wheeljack. <laughs> or as the internet has so unlovingly dubbed him, Pablo. <laughs> and yeah, this guy ain't Wheeljack, this is Pablo. <laughs> I really thought they were going to go an engineer route. I really thought that they were going to go to Wheeljack to fix Bumblebee. But no, he's just there. He doesn't do anything. Except shoot a gun and go, aye, aye, aye. <laughs> this isn't Wheeljack, this is Pablo. You could have cut him from the film and nothing would have been lost. Absolutely nothing would have been lost. I'm not even saying you should have given him a different name. I'm saying you should have just cut him from the film. He didn't need to exist. He wasn't needed. <laughs> but yes, those are my feelings on Pablo, and I still hate the design. I still hate it. They had the perfect design in Bumblebee. Why didn't they just earthify that? 
The thing is, I like the idea of Wheeljack as a rundown VW bus. I think that's a really cool idea. But come on! Come on! Uh, still love this movie. Anyway, we get another great horror scene when um, the humans are chased through the catacombs by another one of the... the I'm just going to keep calling them the freezers. Kind of stupid, but that's what I'm going to call them. And then we lead to this big O fight between the Autobots and the Terracons, the one on the roadway, and oh my gosh, it is cool. It is fun. Just, Optimus is in rare form. Scourge is so threatening. He's so good. Battle Trap and Nightbird get to show off their skills. Mirage and RC get to show off theirs. It's a good scene. It's a great scene. And then it ends with uh, a, ni a nice little reference. Eraser gets hit by Cosmic Rust. Now, Cosmic Rust first showed up in uh, Transformers Generation 1 because uh, it's established that the Decepticons and Autobots are rust-proof, but there's this special kind of rust that can affect them. And it's kind of like leprosy. It's Cosmic Rust. It was also used in Transformers uh, Animated as a way for Team Char, the Decepticons, to take out Rodimus Prime, which was really, really interesting. Of course, this Cosmic Rust does something a little bit different, because normally Cosmic Rust just kind of incapacitates and or kills you. This one... Well, we'll see. The bots and cons are able to escape. Not the bots and cons. Bots and humans <laughs> are able to escape. And we meet the Maximals, and Optimus Primal is great. I love Optimus Primal in this movie. I love seeing Optimus Prime and Optimus Primal together. I love the little references to the Beast Wars being from the future. It's like, I am named after the legendary warrior of Cybertron. Your sacrifice becomes our code. All these different things. He's not the Optimus Prime I thought he would be. These little hints that if you know, you know. If you're a Transformers nerd, it's like, wait... They're referencing that they're from the future, and of course we know that the transport key has the ability to teleport time and space, not just time. So not only is Unicron trapped in a different galaxy, he's trapped in a different time. And then we like Unicron mentioned something about to Scourge of like Soon you will wish you died with the rest of your planet. And I'm like, where did Scourge come from? Is Scourge from a future version of Cybertron? Is this the fate of Cybertron in the future? Is that why the Maximals aren't on Cybertron anymore? Just these these Easter eggs, these references that I'm like, there's something interesting here. And I'm honestly excited to see if we're gonna get more to this. But no, Prime and Primal together on the big screen, that was just awesome. This does bring me to another criticism, though. Rhinox and Cheetor are just kind of there. Now, they look great in both robot and beast mode. But come on! <sighs> Unlike Pablo, they don't feel superfluous. They just feel... They feel like they could have used another half hour to get to know them. We only really get to know Air Razor and Optimus Primal. These guys, we don't. And it really is a shame. It really is. And that's what I am discovering, is you have... These, these these characters, the Elena and Wheeljack and Rhinox and Cheetor that just are just there. There's another character who's just there in its stratosphere, but I think that works for him. Like he's fine. Like stratosphere is perfectly fine for me. But Wheeljack was marketed as a main character. The Maximals were marketed as main characters. 
Elena was marketed as the main character, and while she technically still is, and it's things like this. I really, really like this movie, and you've noticed I've praised it for the most part, but there are things like that that it's just like, there is so much you could have done with this character. I mean, especially with Bumblebee, he's dead right now. Wheeljack is an engineer. In, that's Wheeljack's thing. He's the mad scientist. Couldn't he be cooking up some way to do this? Couldn't Wheeljack be the one who gives um, Noah the, the, the glove gun thing? Well, again, it kind of ties into Mirage later, but... Wheeljack's the inventor! Wheeljack's the mad scientist! And he's just absolutely wasted for a kind of lame joke. <laughs> It's... Yeah. It really is a shame. But I'm able to look past that because in this moment we, we have some great moments of pathos with Optimus and Optimus Primal and Air Razor and the humans who guarded the Transwarp Key and Primal like he's not the Prime I thought he'd be and Optimus just struggling. Like, I just want to save my home. I just want to go home, I'm so tired. I'm so sick of having to hide in this world, and it's so good. And then we have a, probably my favorite moment from Elena, where she points out to Noah, you and Optimus are kind of similar. And it very much reminds me of, like, Jack in Transformers Prime being compared to a younger Orion Pax. And I really like those parallels between Prime and the main human. I think it really helps cement that. But this time, Prime has something he needs to learn, too. And it's really, really, really good. Then the next scene, we have the lone tragedy, the, only, the lone long-term tragedy of the film in Air Razor. Scourge's cosmic rust turns her into a terror con. And Optimus Primal is forced to kill her, and it's so good. It's it's not like a lot of the deaths in the Bay movies, which were just kind of blown up, you're dead. There's actually time given to I'm mourning Ares' death. It's not like in the first movie, Prime, we couldn't save him. Ah, oh, Jazz, we have made new friends. There's actual weight. Primal is like, I lost an old friend. Prime is like, I'm sorry. Because he knows what it's like to lose comrades. Noah, same thing. He knows what it's like to lose comrades as well. There's... It's just... It's great. It, it's emotion. It really is just some really, really good emotion. And then there's another bit of emotion where Noah is about to destroy the transport key and Optimus is like please no. And it's this moment of the two connecting. And I really like it. Unfortunately, Airazor dies. Scourge gets both halves of the transport key and prepares to bring Unicron to Earth. There is a sense of we've lost but then Optimus and Noah have another moment and both of them kind of end up taking the lead and it's awesome like Noah does alright form up and then and then everyone's like how are we supposed to do this and they lay out the plans and all that and then Prime comes in and does his Captain America moment his all Noah and Elena you sneak under the ducks, Autobots, Maximals, we're gonna rush. We're gonna rush it. We're gonna distract Scourge. Oh, but what if we die? And all this stuff, and he's like, then we'll die fighting. <laughs> I can think of no better cause to die for. Till all are one. All this stuff. And it's... This is the point in the movie where Optimus becomes Optimus Prime. This is the point in the movie where he is the prime we know and love. Then we get this this moment. 
on the rise. The Terracons are looking up. The Autobots and Maximals are standing there. And then we get such a good moment. Autobots, Maximals, roll out! It's so good. And they charge into the fray. And we get Cheetor, Rhinox, Maximize. And the Maximals transform. And even though Cheetor and Rhinox don't get much to do, they look awesome. They look good. And so does Optimus Primal. We get some good on the battlefield banter. Even Optimus gets some in. Like, he and Primal are attacking Battle Trap. And Prime's about to do the final strike, and then Primal does. He was mine. <laughs> it was funny, and it was awesome. But through it all, Scourge isn't distracted. Mirage races up and starts to distract Scourge. He's no match. Scourge is an absolute titan. He nearly kills Mirage. And then Mirage turns into, turns into a suit of armor to help Noah. Well, from the, the transwarp key pulsing out, some raw energon is activated underneath Bumblebee. And our boy is back in the fray. There's this great, great scene. Bumblebee's jumping out of stratosphere. He's just ch -ch 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 shooting these Terracon eggs that Unicron is launching from himself. And uh, the si this, this, this shot of Unicron emerging from the portal, the clouds appearing over Earth, was so good. So good. But then Bumblebee just does a full-on superhero landing. He kills Nightbird and... He says, and pardon my French here, he threw the radio, I am here to kick ass. <laughs> and I just laughed and cheered at the same time. It was so funny, and I loved seeing Bumblebee be awesome. Because again, I love Bumblebee, and seeing him come back was really good. And I'm glad he's the only one who technically came back. Now some will say, well Mirage, we knew Mirage wasn't dead, though. I mean, we did in there for a little bit, but I'm saying at the end, we knew Mirage wasn't dead. We only thought he was dead for a brief moment, but like, Air Razor's dead. Bumblebee, on the other hand, isn't. And I just thought it was a great scene. But then we come to my absolute favorite bit. And that's Optimus versus Scourge. So, Noah and Elena, they're doing their thing. They're trying to help. And this is a moment that I was kind of worried they were going to do because there is a tendency in Transformers properties to have the human save the day. So it looks like Elena's about to enter the code. Scourge blasts the console. Unicron's coming. There's only one way to stop it. And Optimus makes... A choice. I'll destroy the key. Optimus is no longer willing to sacrifice a world to save him, to return to his own. And in fact is willing to lay down his life for this world. And it's that moment where it's like, that's Optimus Prime. And we get this awesome rematch between Prime and Scourge. It's Absolutely brutal, but not in the bay kind of, not in the bayhem kind of way. Just it's visceral. These two have been going at it the entire movie. Prime has been frustrated and angry at Scourge the entire time, and now we get this cathartic moment. Now you will see the power of a Prime, and he rips Scourge's head off, and it's so, so cool. But then there's my favorite scene. Optimus pulls out his axe. Well, no, it's the stub of his sword. He pulls out his axe later. He pulls out the stub of his sword. He walks up to the transwarp key, and Unicron goes, No, Prime, I can give you whatever you want. And Prime says, Then die. 
and he breaks the transwarp key. Unicron kind of makes this black hole and gets sucked in to the portal. And Optimus is about to go with him. But then Noah comes back to save Optimus. Now it looks like Noah and Optimus are both going in. Noah says, till all are one. And then Optimus Primal comes in. Autobot, Human, and Maximal working together. And then we get that great scene from the trailer. Optimus transforming, Noah being a thruster on the back, Primal leaping off. We get that great scene of the Autobots and the Maximals riding alongside each other. To get this, this moment of is Unicron dead? Not dead, merely trapped. He could be back. Let him come. We get a closing monologue from Optimus about how he's going to protect the world. And a closing monologue from Noah further servicing their parallel arcs. And the main bulk of the movie ends there. But then we have a couple mid credit scenes. Well, in one of them, I'll do the more inconsequential one first. Mirage gets a new bot. Like, it's good to see that Mirage has been fixed, but I kind of knew he was coming back. Like, it kind of, it, it wasn't really a surprise. But, it was funny. And plus, we got to see Reek exposed to Mirage, and that was really cool. But no, the, the other scene, <laughs> is one that I was freaking excited about. I've seen some people complain about it, but... I mean. Noah goes in for another job interview, and the guy he's talking to, a guy named Agent Burke, is kind of shifty. He hands Noah a business card. He, ta he talks as if he knows about the Transformers. He says, we're at war, we're gonna need their help, and your help. He pushes a plaque that says, The Real Hero Award. Secret Lair. And on the card, G.I. Joe. I have wanted a G.I. Joe Transformers crossover in on the screen. Like show or movie. Since I was a kid. My dad's wanted it even longer because he was alive back then. Back in the 80s. I was born in the late 90s. But I'm just sitting over here like, this is awesome. But of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be quality. For me, this was kind of like a, like at the end of Iron Man, I'd like to talk to you about the Avengers Initiative. However, I am not blind to certain things. With like, bringing it to the MCU, we know that the current state of film is hit or miss. Now, while I haven't completely bailed on the MCU, like I said, I really loved Guardians Volume 3, which is the most recent MCU project. Phase 4 and 5 have been rather hit or miss in a lot of ways. And... People are sadly starting to question the validity of franchises. I'm not. I personally think a franchise can still work. I'm actually excited for a lot of the new DC projects that are coming up. Though I have very mixed feelings about Flash, personally. But Blue Beetle looks like it's going to be really cool. I'm kind of irritated that they're not just making Robert Pattinson's Batman the default Batman. I love Batman. Why do we need so many Batman? There are so many freaking Batman. Ugh. But anyway. I think franchises can still work. And I'm, I'm still of the opinion that the MCU can still be good. Now, the Marvels probably isn't going to do well. These are not well-received characters. It's probably not going to do well. And I have no illusions that it's going to, but I have hope that 
people will begin to realize, because Guardians Volume 3, Spider-Man No Way Home, th these movies are the ones that got the butts in seats. These movies are the ones that got the rave reviews. And I consider Rise of the Beast to be a very similar kind of film. It's not concerned with preaching to me. It's not concerned with modern day politics. It's not concerned with inserts social issue here. It's concerned with let's show some Transformers. I've seen some people complain about like what Noah and them go through near the beginning, like Reek going, I'm fighting against capitalism or whatever. But well, those are one-off lines that have nothing to do with the plot. And again, what Noah and Elena are dealing with has nothing to do with their race and everything to do with their socioeconomic status. They're very relatable problems. I don't care what skin color you are. Noah was rejected because he was Hispanic. He was rejected because of insubordination. I don't need people like you, meaning I don't need people who are insubordinate. But, so yeah, I just consider those arguments to be absolutely rubbish. And it really is another case of the anti-woke crowd being just as bad as the woke crowd, which is, and that's not the, the people who are, that's not people who are conservative and progressive. Like, there are good conservatives, good progressives, bad conservatives, bad progressives. No, the, the woke crowd is the, well, if there is no representation, it's racist, and the anti-woke crowd is, if there is representation, it's woke, and it's, like, no, both of you are stupid. <laughs> this is a movie about Transformers, and that's what I care about. But I'm also glad that the human characters were fun. Noah is definitely the best live-action human protagonist. Like, Charlie was a good character, and she had some great moments, but, well, she was a character in a slice-of-life film that had Transformers in it. Noah was a character in a Transformers movie, and he was a heck of a lot of a better one than Sam Witwicky or Cade Yeager. So, a few minor quibbles aside, Elena's character feeling a tad superfluous, Will Jack being an absolute waste of space, Rhinox and Cheetor not really getting enough. The movie was really good. I've heard, like, I heard reviews before I went in, like, oh, the second act is kind of boring, and I was like, oh, I'm not bored. What are you talking about? I, I was never bored. I was entertained the entire time. It was really fun. It was really good, and well, I actually rewatched the the first episode of series one of Doctor Who after coming home from the movie, and I was actually kind of reminded of it because well, you have this human character who's thrust into the world, this powerful, mysterious alien, this mysterious alien war, who feels like a well fleshed out character who plays a role in defeating the villain, and. I'm over here like, that's how I feel about Noah. It's not how I felt about Sam. <laughs> but it's how I feel about Noah. But again, I love that the actual heroic moment went to Optimus. Because in the first film, Sam shoved the Allspark in Megatron's chest. In the second film, even though Optimus was the one who killed the Fallen, Sam brought him back to life. The third film, it was Optimus. Optimus was the one who got to do the cool stuff. But... Prime was the one who got to make a sacrifice, make a stand, and they gave Optimus a character arc, and a character arc that made sense, and a character arc that makes me excited for future versions of this, future stories about this rendition of Optimus. I'm excited to see what they can tell with this Autobot cast. Like, more Mirage, Bumblebee is always great, more RC, ditch Pablo and bring the real wheeljack. And I don't care what you have to do. Just ditch Pablo, please. Not to mention the implication that Unicron's still out there. And here's the big one. I'm ready for Megatron again. 
Can we, in this next film, finally get some good Decepticons? Like, Shatter and Dropkick were a lot of fun. I thought they were really fun minor villains. I mean, they were the main villains for the Bumblebee movie, but minor villains in, a, in the grand scheme of things. The Terror Cons are a great setup for Unicron and his overwhelming threat, but before we get back to Unicron, can we just have Megatron? And can we just have Megatron as the main villain? Because he hasn't been the main villain of something since 2007. And especially with all the good guy Megatron stuff going on around with like Earthspark and all that stuff. It's like, I just want a good bad guy Megatron, like in Transformers Animated, like in Transformers Prime. Just this absolutely threatening figure. And they proved with Scourge that they can make a threatening villain, so I'm like, do what you did with Scourge? But make it Megatron's character. So, my overall thoughts on Transformers Rise of the Beasts. I do think it's the best live-action Transformers film. Is it the best Transformers film? No, that still goes to the 86 movie. But it is the best live-action one. And, well, considering it did it, pretty decent opening weekend at the box office. If it can keep that up, if it can keep going, like, I really want this film to break even. At least break even. But I really want it to make a profit. Because any quibbles I might have had about this film are minor at the end of the day, and I'd love to see this franchise continue. I'd love to see it rise from the ashes of the Fallen Bay films. And, like, whether they want to introduce new char new human characters, whether they want to keep Noah on, or whether they want to move Noah over to a G.I. Joe project, like, I wouldn't mind if Noah stuck around. But, what I really want to see is, one, this Autobot cast as we have them, minus Pablo, and more Autobots. I want to see a G1 e Ironhide. I want to see Ratchet. I want to see the Dinobots done right. I want to see Jetfire. I want to see Ultra Magnus. I want to see Blur. Drift. That would be really cool if they could get an actual good drift. Hot Rod. I want to see what we can do with Starscream, Soundwave, Megatron, Shockwave. The other Seekers, the Insecticons, just Scourge, Cyclone, well not Scourge, we had, we had Scourge, but Cyclonus, and maybe eventually Galvatron. So as it stands, is this movie perfect? No, it's a summer popcorn flick. If you're expecting Citizen Kane, you're going to be disappointed, but if you're expecting a fun Transformers romp, I think you'll like it. If you're a Transformers fan, I think you'll like it. Unless you're one of the snobby ones. To where if it's not my chosen thing, you don't like it. <laughs> I'm not just going to say G1ers because there's Bayversers, there's Armada Stands, there's Prime Simps, there's Animated. Just everyone has their golden calf. Everyone has their one piece of Transformers media that is better than all the rest. But if you're not one of those, I mean, everyone has one that they think is better than the rest, is what I'm saying. And there are those who will hold everything to that standard and thus will hate anything that's not that. But if you're not one of those, and you like Transformers, I think you'll like this. I think you'll like it a lot. It's not perfect, but it's a heck of a, lot, of a lot better than what we've gotten recently. I have rambled for a very long time. I thank you for watching these unhinged ramblings, and I will see y'all in my next one, whenever that is. See ya.